Nathaniel, one of the key legal <laughs> lawyers in the, who's behind the scenes on a lot of the key telemedicine policies, who's been really active at ATA and so on. You better see him all over the place. We're really pretty honored to have him at our, our webinar today. Uh, again, so if you read Nathaniel's uh, background, you can see him. He's been just all over the place in terms of telemedicine coverage. He really is an uh, so expert in this one. And Nathaniel, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Thank you for having me, Milton. It's uh, my pleasure to be here, and I uh, hope that we're going to enjoy some time talking and a lot of Q&A. Mm -hmm. I'm going to spend about 10 minutes just to go over a high-level amount of uh, three different areas that we kind of call here the telemedicine triple threat, mm -hmm. reimbursement, insurance, and HIPAA. Okay. Yeah, this will be great. This will be, how about, let's dive in. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so I, I'm a, just for all the people attending, I'm a lawyer. I'm a uh, partner at Foley and Lardner, and I'm the chair of our telemedicine uh, and virtual care practice and co-chair of our digital health group. So I'm involved in the ATA um, and other uh, telemedicine advisory boards. And today we can go, uh, the only other thing to mention is I'm on a, I have a Twitter feed. I know VC and Milton also have a Twitter feed as well. Uh, mine is at Laxman, and it's all telehealth law and business, so certainly feel free to follow it and you'll, all, you'll have a bunch of breaking news in, on the industry for regulation. If we could go to the next slide. Okay, so this uh, slide I'm a big fan of. It's an inside joke on an early telemedicine model for hospitals called the hub and spoke model, where in the middle you would have a academic medical center or a hospital or even a really robust multi-specialty physician group. And all the little um, spoke sites around the outside would be a critical access hospital, for example, or a smaller acute care hospital or maybe a community mental health center. But those are the originating sites where the patient is located. And uh, those little blue swirly lines in between, that could represent the telemedicine uh, technology, the communication platform through which the providers would deliver their care. So if you're savvy to telemedicine, you might pick up that as an inside joke. In this context, it's a, a pinwheel of the primary legal and regulatory issues that would need to be addressed in uh, telemedicine practice. And I say telemedicine practice a bit more loosely because it is not a specialty service. It's not like cardiology or nephrology, but rather it's a technological conduit through which you would deliver that care. So you can deliver cardiology or you could deliver nephrology consults. Um, but as such, it makes it a bit more complicated because it is an overlay over all the various legal and regulatory issues associated with delivering healthcare, uh, particularly complicated if you uh, harness the power of telemedicine to deliver care across boundaries without regard to geographic borders. So then you'd be subject to uh, laws of mul multiple states uh, as well as uh, multiple countries if you so uh, explore international. And that's not to make you scared or to make you hesitant. You should really embrace these opportunities because it is the technology is unique in that you're not going to be able to expand your reach and fulfill your mission of delivering care to patients in Chile, right, by posting uh, billboards on busy intersections in your city of you know, Cincinnati. So we're going to pick up on a couple of these issues here today, primarily licensure. We'll talk about reimbursement and privacy and security. But I don't want to downplay any of the others, and you can just keep it there as a bit of a reference. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, we're going to talk about reimbursement and payment here next. Now, I really, when working with clients, I, I really shy, I try to get them to shy away from the term reimbursement because it carries baggage. Reimbursement to me connotes a fee-for-service methodology paid for by the government after the fact. And many entrepreneurial businesses out there do not so heavily rely on the government as their customer or as their payer uh, compared to healthcare. It's, it's surprising. It's one of the criticisms, I think, also, 
of the healthcare system and how the Medicare and Medicaid budgets have gotten so significant. People need these services and they utilize them. But at the same time, they're not the ones directly paying out of pocket when, they're, when they purchase them. So there's a bit of a disconnect. And a lot of providers complain, oh, there's no reimbursement. Uh, I'm just not getting reimbursed. That, that is true to a certain extent. But if you change your mindset to look at revenue opportunities associated with telehealth, you'll see a significant increase in your opportunities to drive growth, fulfill your mission, and deliver care. So you'll see here in this little bubble, government fee-for-service is only one, one of many. Medicare Advantage plans and Medicaid MCOs are a great opportunity for providers to proactively contract with them to cover services delivered via telehealth. Those types of entities are not um, bound by the same coverage restrictions that Medicare fee-for-service and Medicaid is restricted. In fact, these type of health plans are charged by the government to be innovative, find new ways to deliver care more efficiently, to promote access and quality, and use private contracting ingenuity to do so. I would really encourage you to take advantage of that, and I really think that only a minority of notable uh, providers using telehealth are targeting MA plans and Medicaid MCOs. Providers are leaving quite a bit of um, rocks uh, unexplored. Similarly, commercial health plans, we'll talk about that in the next couple slides. Uh, they're sometimes a tougher nut to crack if the state law doesn't require them to cover it, but it's an opportunity. Moving around the horn, employer self-funded plans, ERISA plans, the next one is employer out of pay. Targeting employers for te with telehealth services as an employee benefit is pretty tried and true. We've seen a number of studies forecasting that by the end of this year, 2018, more than 70, 75% of large employers will offer a telehealth benefit. So I, I don't want to suggest that that market is saturated, but it has certainly uh, been well explored and largely embraced by employers. That being said, there's a number of different types of care you can deliver via telehealth and low acuity triage consults is merely just one aspect, right? The, the large provider like the Teladoc, um, uh, Teladocs of the world, they do one thing, they do it very well, but that's only one component of care. It's as if you were to tell someone you can get all of your health care needs by going to a, a walk-in clinic. No, you can get a significant uh, chunk of them, particularly access, but let's not forget the other uh, uh, providers in the care continuum. Institutions and provider arrangements is another great one. Telestroke, uh, that's a hospital hospital arrangement and it can drive revenue. There is no third party that you're submitting the claims to. You might do some claims of reassignment, uh, but that's a business to business contract. Self pay and cash, there's a huge appetite among patients who already have health insurance coverage to still come out of pocket and pay for telemedicine uh, services because of the rapid responsiveness and the access and after hours and ease of which they can act, uh, obtain the services. And finally, cost savings and cost avoidance. I'm not usually a big proponent of building a business model purely around cost or service line around cost savings. Uh, notwithstanding that, hospitals have largely embraced uh, concepts of Six Sigma to increase their efficiency and save a lot of money. They, of all the clinical studies out there uh, that are continuing to explore telehealth-based services and tie it to cost savings, in my opinion, the ones that have had the most definitive uh, favorable results are ones that assess the virtual ICU or, or EICU program. Those definitely, although it's a notable investment in spend, have, uh, have shown significant ROI for the hospital using it, um, notable reductions in avoidable readmissions, increases in quality, increases in staff satisfaction, reductions in deeper fatigue. And so that's a good example of a revenue um, opportunity based on cost savings. Next slide. So I mentioned there's 31 states plus the District of Columbia with telehealth commercial insurance coverage laws. That, those laws mean that the health plan is required to cover telehealth based services to the same extent that plan covers them if they were delivered in person. There's 30, uh, here's the map of the U.S. It looks great, right? It's all green. That means everybody in that state is uh, happy and gets full coverage of their telehealth services. No, uh, let's go to the next slide.
This is like Nate's interpretation after reviewing all of the statutes and working with different provider clients who actually have to negotiate. And it shows a very different picture of the landscape. Now, all the gray states here are states without any coverage law whatsoever. The uh, green states are states with pretty broad uh, consumer-friendly telehealth coverage laws. The states in yellow are limited coverage. They'll have um, soft language or language that includes the originating site or um, offers a lot of outs, right, escape hatches for health plans to say, you know what, I'm actually only going to cover five codes of services. The states in blue have broad coverage and also payment parity. Payment parity is another concept in insurance, and it doesn't relate to the coverage or whether or not a service is covered, but it relates to how much the health plan will pay for that. If a state has payment parity, it largely means that the health plan must pay the provider the same rate for a telehealth service that it pays for an in-person service. That could differ from provider to provider depending upon what they actually contract for with the plan in their participation agreement. A large provider with effective negotiation might just get higher uh, payment rates than a small provider that just takes whatever is offered to them. The biggest problem here is if you pass a coverage law that's broad but don't have a payment parity provision in there, some plans may say, I'm only going to pay you 50% of your contracted rate. That's exactly what happened in New York uh, around this time last year. And it means that providers who are in network have to accept payment as, as full uh, of the rate that the plan pays. And they can no longer balance bill the patients or even give the patients an opportunity to pay cash out of pocket. So in a, a sense, that environment made it even worse for those uh, providers who had the foresight and um, interest in offering telemedicine services because before there was coverage, they could at least give their patients the option to pay out of pocket. After the coverage rule went into effect and the reimbursement was only 50%, they were losing money every time they provided the service and they couldn't charge the patients anymore. So a number of them said, I'm just not gonna offer telemedicine services anymore until I'm actually gonna get paid a fair rate. It's the dark side of, uh, of the coverage laws. Let's go to the next section. Okay, we can go to the next slide. This will be telemedicine and licensure. The, the, the basic rule is that the, the doc, let's pick, doc, pick on doctors. The doctor must be licensed to practice medicine in the state where the patient is located at the time of the consult. All right, so let's say Milton is in Virginia or California right now. Let's, let's say California, and I'm in Florida. Um, if he is the doctor and I'm the patient and he wants to do a consult with me, he needs to have a license to practice medicine in Florida. Now. Sounds easy, but in the actual practical real world, it's very different. Because let's say Milton is my doctor, and I've been seeing him for a number of years, and I live in California, but now I'm on vacation in Florida or vacation in New York, and I need a follow-up with him. Or maybe I'm feeling sick and he's who I trust. Well, technically, in most states, he, needs, he still needs to have a license where I'm located. Um, do boards of medicine, are, are they interested in cracking down on... Um, those activities where a doctor and a patient have pre-existing relationships for years and they're just having temporary consults while the patient's traveling, no, that's not in their interest to do so. But if instead Milton was to advertise and hold himself out as a doctor across the country, charge patients for consults, uh, particularly for first brand new patients, that's a, that's a very different um, approach. It's the same clinical occurrence, right? Doctor-patient consult via telemedicine, but you see how the risk assessment and the um, way it would be interpreted is very different depending upon the business model and the approach that the provider takes. Now in this slide, we've laid out five of the primary exceptions to medical licensure that are often used in the telemedicine context. There's more exceptions to licensure for like emergency care and whatnot, but this is what we, we see most frequently for telemedicine. I'll start from the bottom up. It's uh, FSMB compact states. It's not nearly the promise of the compact. Is, um, in my opinion, it's not as fulfilled as much as it, it could have been or, or many providers wanted it to be. It's not as broad or truly reciprocal as the nurse licensure compact that is in ex existence in about 31 states. Another exception is for follow-up care. So this is, let's say, I fly out somewhere, have surgery at the uh, world-renowned surgical center. I fly home. They need to do post-op follow-up. 
Uh, they can do that via telemedicine. About six states offer an explicit exception to licensure. The rest of the states do not. Um, but then you're challenged here with the balance of continuity of care and fulfilling your uh, professional obligations for standard of care versus uh, a, maybe a technical uh, licensure violation, something that needs to be assessed. Another is a special license or registration for telemedicine. I think these are going away. Uh, there might have been about 10 or 11 at one point. Now we see maybe six or seven. And as a practical matter, it's not any quicker to get those licenses processed. Bordering state, a few states offer reciprocity uh, if you uh, practice and live in a bordering state. And finally, the consultation exception <clears throat> for physician peer-to-peer -peer consults. This exists in 49 of the 50 states and can be used in telemedicine context. Technically, Washington State doesn't really have it for telemedicine consults after they put out a guidance, a board guidance a couple of years ago that um, probably inadvertently closed that loop. As my understanding, they're going to maybe rewrite their rules to account for it. And this is what we often see for consultative models. Next slide. This slide shows the life cycle of a destination medicine arrangement uh, predicated maybe on an online second opinion or specialty consult. At the top, the patient initiates the contact, finds out about the provider, selects them typically online. They get their second opinion assessment typically through a peer-to-peer -peer consultative arrangement. They arrange for the follow-up care, travel to the hospital for their treatment, go home and get post-treatment follow-up care. This is a great model for centers of excellence for any hospital, particularly children's hospitals or specialty uh, groups that have something they're very proud of that's been ranked by U.S. News and World Report, that they buy ad space in airplanes, uh, at airports, cancer centers. They, all of them should be doing this. It is shocking how few of them are. You can easily find that just by Googling, you know, online second opinion and fill out whatever specialty, and you'll see a dearth of it. And there's only a few, and those that are doing it will um, consume the market in the next 10 years because patients will continue to be attracted to them. The same concept can apply in international arrangements to great success. The last topic I'm going to cover is telemedicine privacy and security. We can go to the next advanced two slides. And largely, when you're talking about privacy and security in the telemedicine context, I think some, some lawyers or whatnot overemphasize the complexity. Look, you have been most everybody on this call, I presume, has been storing or transmitting patient health information electronically for a while now. They have EMRs, right? They have um, device policies. Simply because now you're practicing telemedicine using the technology does not change the analysis uh, for how you store uh, and protect medical records uh, electronically. But the, this little, this slide here has uh, some tips for when you use um, PHI health information in connection with mobile devices. Because I, I think I see that a lot more. Um, you, you would take a company like VC, right? Maybe they have an app available and you deploy that to all your uh, physicians on staff and then your patients as well. And that takes it can take it one level further from keeping records on your EMR and your servers. Really, server is a server, but I would just recommend you take a look at some of these, uh, these tips uh, when you assess your own policy. We can go to the next slide. Oh, and that's my contact information. So that's about 15, 20 minutes on the button. And now we can, um, I'm just going to pass it back to Milton. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, okay. Apologize for the uh, technical glitch. Uh, I'll say thank you so much for that. That was one of the best presentation I have heard about this. The legal issues in there again. Thank you. Thank you so much in there. Uh, I guess Anne, can you bring on the audio question uh, panel? Um, I guess while we're uh, bringing on the audio question panel in there, um, so the. Um, you the the second slide. Well, not the second. One of the slides you show her. There's actually a parity law where everyone talk about. Then you that was actually in real life. In there, I thought that was extremely useful. In there, 
Now, supposedly, I'm a physician in a certain state, I have a certain specialty, and I want to figure out exactly what that insurance, the, um, the, how much the coverage will be. Like, other than hiring, let's say, hiring you or hiring a lawyer, is there, what's the best sort? Is there some information place that someone can go there to research, like, for their particular, uh, um, particular condition? Sure, how to find out coverage. There's two ways to, well, there's a number of ways, but to your question, outside of working with an expert or a consultant, yeah. two ways. One is if you're a patient, one is if you're a provider. If you're a patient, you can reach out to your health plan, and they'll have your benefits package, and they'll be able to explain to you to what extent telehealth services are covered generally under your policy. Okay? And you can even go a step further and say, hey, I want to get this particular treatment. You don't need to know the code. Right, they'll give that to you. Other side, if you're a provider, many of these policies are only two to three pages long. Okay. But they are often only available if you're an in-network provider and you log into their password secured uh, portal. That's why a lot of folks like you and I can't actually access it. It creates confusion. That's the first step. Check with the payer, log in, and find it. You may find that uh, it's broad. You may also find that it's quite narrow, sometimes narrower than the law requires in which case you should take every effort to reach out proactively to those various payers and you could make the case to say look I'm not asking you to change your policy plan wide but our participation agreement let's talk about having a, uh, an addendum a one page uh, amendment for telehealth based services and our clients have been pretty successful in that. Got it, okay that's helpful there. Another uh, comment you made that I really liked about how you're Open account box where you know so many people focus on about reimbursement, which is probably the fee for service model, versus there's all these other news for revenue opportunity that telemedicine enables. Like, so what are some of the maybe is like you consider like maybe um, top revenue opportunity other than this reimbursement, or maybe like rather than unexplored, you think is like it's actually really lucrative people should be exploring. Um, yeah, that's a good question. What, what, I think what you need to do, it depends upon what your company is, right? If you're a telemedicine provider, like that's all you do as a, uh, like a teledoc type of a company, you're offering one nature of something and you really want to target the payers because it's a cost savings opportunity that you're presenting. Okay. If instead, let's say you're a hospital, uh, your business largely is delivering medical care. So you look to ways that other people could receive and purchase that care from you not just the third-party payer. So I would absolutely explore international arrangements. I would explore in-state okay. arrangements with rural areas. Because not only would that turn into revenue under the actual contract itself, it can have a halo effect of additional relationships and uh, permitted referrals of new patients and new business to your hospital. Because it's giving them, it's giving you an opportunity to interact with them and show how responsive and how excellent you can be. Okay. Got it. Okay, sounds good. But another um, another uh, um, note you made that I thought that was really interesting. And talk about so, for example, if you have a patient that your patient just were uh, happen to be traveling to different states in there, then you actually are able to provide the telemedicine even though you don't have the license uh, in those states. Now, the, does that mean pretty much, long as you have this a patient relationship in your normal state, then is that just a blanket? in there where is there any like subtleties that physicians should be careful about? Sure, there are a lot of subtleties and, and I, you know, the example I gave was not to say that you absolutely can do that without a license to yeah. practice medicine, but uh, because you do need to have it unless it's, you meet an exception. But it's to show the alignment of what the intent of the medical boards are to protect health and safety, the continuity of the doctor-patient relationship and the tension between these different care obligations and, and licensure when patients uh, travel across states. I, I think we're, we may see a change in some of that tenor, but we might not. Uh, the only, and that's okay. We can have these laws in place and then if medical boards use their appropriate discretion to determine whether and when it's appropriate to sanction certain activity and other times they say, you know what, we find this uh, to be exceptional, um, I think that we'll see that. Moreover, if you meet an exception to licensure like consultation or whatnot or follow-up, 
don't be misled to the idea that you're not practicing medicine. I believe you need to own it. You're a doctor. You are practicing medicine. You're just doing so under a recognized rule that says you don't need to have a license in this particular state. So yeah, you could still you still need to be aware of medical malpractice and, and insurance sure. coverage and providing care. It's not like anything goes. Yeah. But I think that there is some real opportunity there for doctors who want to take the time to explore it. Yeah, the reason I ask that is, is that when, uh, we see a lot of activity in telemedicine is in the concierge, uh, you know, those medical African, those uh, patient demographics seem to be more like the you know, travel more, the various things. That, so we get crash crash on that like uh, like all the time in there. So um, so we have an audience question for uh, Jeffrey. So he's asking, um, are ERISA uh, self self funded plans exempt from states? Mandate. Yeah, I probably got this question maybe 20 times in the last year or something. Yes, ERISA plans. Those are those are like fe federal um, uh, uh, rule laws with that for employer self-funded plans. And by and large, these state commercial coverage laws do not apply to ERISA plans. The the ERISA laws preempt them. Okay, great. Okay. So I have another question from uh, Lauren. So. So regarding the um, the parity laws, uh, do the payers have to comply regardless of the contract between the payer and the provider says? Like what if, for example, if the provider did not include uh, telehealth as a cover benefit in the contract with the payer? Does it have to say, like, I guess, telehealth is covering the contract with the payer? Well, most participation agreements are follow largely the same format and and because plans have such high volume their in-house lawyers don't like to customize agreements too much oftentimes what they'll do is a one or two pager addenda that says okay section 2.5 2.4 is deleted but they don't actually delete it in the body of the contract so there is definitely opportunity for negotiation customization but not like you would normally see so as a result it's the policy itself that kind of hangs out there and you need to be aware of it Got it. Okay. I guess in terms of like the, I have a question from Lori. Uh, so it's regarding, um, what are your thoughts in terms of like uh, the legal issues regarding the skilled nursing facilities? In there is there anything extra about that segment? Um, sure. I think uh, SNFs, skilled nursing facilities, and other long-term care facilities uh, are really great venues for telehealth-based services. Okay. SNF, I think, counts as originating site under Medicare if it's in a rural area and meets the other trapping. So there's opportunity there. Uh, even for private pay, like a high-end uh, continuing care retirement facility or assisted living facility where the patients are just paying cash out of pocket, could be a great way to say, oh, you know what, mom and dad want the access, higher level access to these uh, experts via telehealth for their checkups. I would like that uh, for my parents, and I, I think many other people would. It's an industry that has not been nearly as tapped into or explored as uh, telepsychiatry or uh, neuro. Um, we're seeing more of them in some startups. An example in that, you know, we represent a number of clients in the space, and it, an example is UPMC has rolled out, uh, it's called uh, Curavi, and yeah. it's basically telehealth targeted to post-acute SNF. Got it in there. What about in terms of like the, um, something adjacent to that? Yes, you have a lot of these sort of home care, you know, staff people come to elderly's home to help around. Those are these are again non medical staff. So, is there any uh, issues for these folks able to almost like, uh, let's say, bring, uh, let's say, iPad or some medical equipment, able to connect to, uh, let's say, a physician remotely in there? Is there any issues in terms of like using some of those business models? Uh, the coordination of care post-discharge from hospital is a huge area of waste and loss, not just financially, but really opportunity, because these patients are quasi-abandoned. You know, they really need more hand-holding and, and, and shepherding around to the variety, to physical therapy, to, for non-emergency ambulatory care, uh, home health, uh, all, uh, infusion. And there are startup companies that are trying to crack that nut. Nobody yet. Uh, you definitely can do great things in the space. There are complexities of it because oftentimes the coordinator of the care is someone different from all the different um, home health agencies and the providers. 
and so there are patient steering and anti-kickback considerations that come into play largely because the care coordinator wants to monetize their different uh, arrangements and then as part of the arrangement they basically have to shepherd and steer referrals. So there's a tension there, uh, building a, a, a an arrangement that complies with the fraud and abuse rules with something that is really effective and as a high user experience. You can do it, but there's no one that has uh, that I know yet that has achieved a lot of scale and notoriety in doing it big and great. I would definitely look to see for more of those in the next two years. Got it. Okay, appreciate that. But another question is for Elizabeth. Um, so she's asking, she wants to have clarification about exactly this payment parity. So specifically, is this, if you see someone says, you know, like that, the, the uh, payment must be the same for telemedicine and versus in-person care. But if the telemedicine counter cannot include a physical exam in there, like or test, I saw if in-person care will do, like how does that hand get treated? How does, well, in most states, you can do a patient examination via telemedicine without an in-person exam, and that's sufficient. But you don't have the equipment, like what, if, what I mean is like if I go to my doctor's office, right, typically, you know, they you know, take my blood pressure, you know, maybe listen to my heart, it's, it's all these things, but that typically, if you use, let's say, Teladoc or American Wall or MD Library, it's not like the patient will have these devices, they're just like, okay, so looking at the phone, so you, are, you don't have that, uh, so exam. So in that case, it's still, uh, I guess, like, right. But that doesn't mean that the service isn't going to be covered or the service is uh, medically um, insufficient. Judd Hollander from Jefferson and with Jeff Connect, uh, I think he's associated with Ross Rothman Institute in Pennsylvania. Within the last couple of weeks, put out a really good article. He's a doctor. Put out a good article on the physical aspect of physical exams via telemedicine and uh, from a doctor's perspective addressed how much you actually can do and how many scenarios you don't really need to lay hands. Dermatology, for example, I had my skin check a week or so ago. My physician did not check my heart rate or my <laughs> pressure. Yet that was a legitimate medical exam for purposes and I'm sure he dropped the claim to my insurance company <laughs> to get paid for it. So there is opportunity. Now that does not mean, if to the, to the viewer's question, if you have a service and you're in a state with very broad coverage and payment parity. But if it's medically deficient or inappropriate you're, because the patient's condition was so complex or necessitated labs or some in-person exam, then you, you shouldn't get paid for it, right? Uh, because utilization review will still apply and uh, an examination below the acceptable standard of care for the patient's clinical scenario, that would be a reason to deny it, whether it's in-person or via telephone. Okay, got it. Appreciate it. So I have a question for uh, Gail. Um, so I guess recently there was um, a study that showed that like when you offer telemedicine, it actually does not uh, decrease costs. Actually, it just it actually increases costs with the insurance uh, in there. So the question is, so for example, there is um, so he, he has found that there are many of the insurance providers actually do not want to provide coverage from for telehealth visits. So what's the best way to approach these insurance provider to, to give them a, a coverage? Sure. Now, I'll take two parts of that question. The first is uh, the study. Now, that I think the, the viewer is probably referring to the RAND Institute yeah. study that came out a week or so ago. And after that study came out, there was this, a lot of blowback from <laughs> industry and clinicians uh, criticizing the study. Everybody's going to criticize the study one way or another. There are a lot of studies out there. Mm -hmm. but, but that study in particular focused only on the short-term medical spend for, I think, acute respiratory illness. It did not, um, as I understand, address if the patient's care would have gone untreated, right, or if the patients would have otherwise got their care in an uh, urgent care walking clinic, something that could be just as expensive, if not more so. Yeah. And Finally, it didn't address the long-term cost savings, right? It, it was only a very narrow thing of, let's say, bronchitis or chest cold. But it, it, so, so it, to a extent, it was one-dimensional and certainly could be criticized. I think all studies have a lot of their, their, their benefits and drawbacks. With regard to how do you actually approach a payer when your state has a really crummy telehealth law or no telehealth law, 
I think that you need to put yourself in the plan's shoes, right? Mm -hmm. To a certain extent, it's true that health plans don't owe anything to providers. Plans owe an obligation to their members, their enrollees. The members are the ones who have a contract with the plan and say, I will pay you thousand dollars a month premium and in, in return you will arrange for the services. So plans have to have qual provide quality and access. Providers are merely a tool through which the plan fulfills its obligations to its members. Just like you could say telemedicine is a tool through which you provide your care. Okay? Mm -hmm. But so many providers have uh, tend to take a myopic view and say these are my patients and, and my care and I demand and deserve to get paid by some unknown amorphous entity for that. Without regard to how much the patient may pay in premiums or what benefit policy they selected or the plan zone obligation. And so the providers that we work with that put themselves in their shoes of the plan use parlance of, instead of reimbursement, they use parlance of medical spend, which is plan language. Instead of patients, they use words like members are much more successful. And then you set up a phone call or a meeting and you talk about what you want to do and achieve, why you want to achieve it, and then Ultimately, you you know lawyer it and paper it in, in an amendment to your participation agreement, and let's say you have it in effect for a year. You add GT modifier or 95 modifier. You track the utilization and the medical spend, and if the plan likes it after a year, they can continue, and if they don't, well then they have ability to terminate. Most participation agreements, a health plan can terminate it without cause and like 60 day notice anyhow, right? So again, it just shows you how singularly dependent many providers are on these third-party payers and they don't realize how much they're at the mercy of the payers sometimes mm -hmm. on how these contracts are structured. So we would behoove you, any of our providers and the payers, to try to work arm in arm and collaborate. Mm -hmm. I know that at the American Telemedicine Association's annual meeting coming up next month, there's actually an entire panel devoted to this topic mm -hmm. and, and collaboration and alignment between plans and providers is a big undercurrent theme of, of this year. Okay, I really appreciate that. Um, so I have a question for Ashish. Um, so they have been creating um, basically platforms for telemedicine to connect in between different countries, you know, like I guess, taking experts from one country, provide second opinion to, you know, you know different countries in there. Um, so what are any uh, particular laws that uh, can restrict this, either both now or in the future, where things uh, they should be as well careful about. Sure, international arrangements. We've built out a lot. I would say probably worked on 14 to 20 different countries in the last 12 months or so. Primarily U.S. medical institutions or medical groups wanting to have arrangements overseas. <clears throat> the laws by and large in international jurisdictions are not going to be as complicated as what we see within the 50 U.S. states. Uh, nor is developed. But a number of them have laws on a practice via telemedicine. Many don't have an express consultation exception to licensure. Rather, they would define, they would exclude from the definition of practicing medicine a consultative relationship. But you need to be careful, and just like you wouldn't uh, or shouldn't uh, run and, and deliver services into a, a new state without understanding the laws or the rules or the approaches, you shouldn't do it in a foreign country. Um, there's a lot of opportunity in foreign countries, though, to bring for destination medicine, to bring patients who have a significant amount of resources and don't have any third-party insurance to pay uh, rack rate for the, for the surgeries and the treatments they have in the U.S. So I understand it's very lucrative, but you need to do the same diligent execution of your legal and business analysis when building it out. Otherwise, you're exposing yourself not just to legal risk, but also, you can have just a, a failed model because you haven't thought it out, and that's just a shame because then, you know, your your reports up in the C-suite will think, oh, telehealth, it just doesn't work or it doesn't work for us. And that's not a failure in the technology. It's a failure in your execution of it. Okay. I appreciate that. We have a question from Lawrence. Uh, he, so he's asking us, uh, so do you think Medicare is going to pass uh, uh, some sort of Medicare telehealth parity law? Uh, so that from the you know, take a patient even with that home doing have taken this would be uh, reimbursed. I hope so. Okay. I do think. <laughs> I, think I think we'll see that in the next uh, two years. Maybe, you know, I, I think we, I, I would like to see it during this this administration. 
Um, it's not up to CMS or HHS. These restrictions are baked into the Federal Social Security Act, so it would require an act of Congress. But there are like four or five bills, bipartisan bills, pending in Congress to eliminate these restrictions. And they are arbitrary restrictions. Yeah. The spend on Medicare telehealth services is infinitesimally small, well less than was predicted before they first made it available in 2001. And as regards to the agency, CMS, HHS, OIG, I feel like they're giving every signal and indication possible to providers that they want to push yeah. telehealth and health information technology. Yeah, that would be very exciting. I think it's our originating side. This cannot be a home that seems to be just like a killer and a down drag into the whole industry. Uh, we have another question about Cody. Um, so he's asking, so uh, what advice would you give uh, telehealth startups you know, who just try to get things off the ground, right? Unfortunately, they can afford to pay lawyers in there, but how do, like, how do they go about to figure out all these sort of, uh, complicated telehealth laws? Sure. I would say we work with a lot of startups, and it's really fun. They're challenging clients. Oftentimes, they're not physicians or healthcare professionals, and they say, uh, I never went to med school. Do I have to deliver care this way? And it makes makes me think twice. And I say, you know what? You don't. Oftentimes, they do have great ideas. Uh, one advice that I give, though, is I think too many just have an idea, and they're they're undercapitalized. So the idea that you want to create a new business in a cutting edge area of technology that's red hot, that is in healthcare one of the most highly regulated industries in the country, short of maybe like defense, you know, uh, and you don't have enough money to hire a lawyer, means that you don't have the, might not have the business foresight to, to get into it, right? You would not open a bakery uh, or a, a stationery store without I having a lawyer. I mean, so, so like the start, sometimes, you know, they are doing the fundraising, they are getting things going. It's almost like, let me be a chicken, right? So like, so eventually they will have the resource, of, but maybe just as they're getting going, they literally say, just kind of like, do they spend that, you know, a couple thousand dollars pay a lawyer? Do they spend that in a hard developer? Pay? It's like, in a really early stage, is there any advice you can? Uh, so if you're really in an early stage, that probably means you have a kernel of an idea. Unless you're a programmer, if you just let me just jump into it and program okay. something, I would not build something without thinking about how I'm going to deploy it, right? What what gap am I filling? What am I proving? What is my pathway? And because you're going to need to answer those questions for venture capital, private equity. We do the same thing working with our clients, talking to them and changing it. So by and large, our pathway working with startups is this. You know, we'll do um, an intro call or a meeting and hear about their ideas and do a lot of listening and then give some suggestions. And we do it on the fly to say, you know what, we've seen behind the curtain on so many different telemedicine virtual care arrangements. These, those elements might not move the needle for your utilization or drive your revenue. Have you thought about this and that? At the same time, we'll immediately prune off um, approaches that would be high risk from a fraud and abuse or legal compliance standpoint. Because if they build out something that might be successful but uh, violates fraud and abuse laws and then take that to a venture capital firm, They'll hire a law firm like mine to do a due diligence review, and it'll just shred the startup, and then they either won't invest or they'll discount the purchase price okay. or they'll put all these onerous closing conditions on. So I think a dollar, a dollar spent on the front end is well okay. worth it. <laughs> Great advice there. Our uh, next question is for uh, Carla. So she's asking, so she applied one on one and a group a health coach coaching uh, by video conference. Uh, is it okay to record these telehealth sessions from the clients? Is there any sort of what are the legal? I guess what are the legal issues regarding re regarding recording uh, uh, the sessions? It's a good question. There was an NPR article last year, a story about that, about recording telehealth sessions and the pros and cons. A lot of um, adult children want that for their parents so they can look back on it, and remember exactly what the directions and the care was. Um, most uh, providers delivering care via telemedicine do not record. If you do, it, uh, know that it's not just a video, it's, it's a medical record, and you need to store it. And let's say you're offering it to kids. Some uh, pediatric hospitals, are, they're subject to 26 years of record storage for a pediatric yeah. record. That's a big expense to store it. And you can't just say, 
I'm going to keep it for a week or two. No, it's a medical record. Now, if you're saying I'm doing health coaching and it's not health care, well, then that might be a little different. And whether a health coach is subject to any regulation would depend upon state law. There's pros and cons, but even in the medical context, if you're confident in the care that you're providing and you give the patient notice and consent that you are going to record, I think it can be beneficial. Got it. So basically, it's almost like I hear, like when you call the lot of these, like the airlines, so they tell you, you know, for quality services, you might record it. So you said more or less is provided you give um, the notified the patient this will be recorded, then you can, as a prior, you can decide to record uh, sort of. Sometimes you have to get the consent. You can't just, uh, you won't be able to just notify them, but they actually have to give the consent. So. With the consent, you mean that explicitly they need to have some sort of checkbox that has sort of explicitly say it's okay. Yeah, or I suppose if you're recording it, you could ask them once before you record, start the recording, and then ask them again so you have their consent recorded. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so one question, um, uh, I know when I were in previous talks, and there, right, so for example, there are some uh, big payers insurance uh, come up, they invested in some like technology startup, in the case like VIDYO, you know, America Wild or some of those in there. So then they told their providers, unless you pay for their that technology platform, they will not reimburse you for the uh, telehealth. Uh, I mean, is that, I guess, uh, what have you, what's your thought? I mean, is that legal? Is that anti-competitive practice? It's actually it's okay. The an I mean, the answer might be yes to all of your questions. If it's legal, and it, it may be legal, and it may be anti-competitive, and it <laughs> may also be beneficial. I'm a, so it is not uncommon to have health plans or health plan-owned entities make investments in all of the really exciting innovation that startup uh, startups are pouring their heart and soul into, right? It's good for the startup because then they can get some funding. It's good for the health plan because we're seeing a trend that the payers want to become more integrated along the delivery lines, diversify their portfolio, right? Foster ways of delivering better, cheaper care, and then actually enjoy the revenue, back end revenue if those companies yeah. really do. Your question about narrow networking, though, yeah, well, that, that's, that's a bit more nefarious. It says, okay, well, this particular provider may have given up an ownership interest in its company, and then they use that as the incentive for other providers to contract with them. Mm -hmm. You know, some laws don't prohibit narrow networking. Some telehealth coverage laws don't prohibit telehealth narrow networking. Some do. The issue is uh, being addressed right now in the state of Colorado because uh, there was pushback, and plans are saying you have to use our, our preferred technology vendor or whatnot, and it's the institutional providers or the physician groups who are kind of left out in the cold. And so there's an amendment to their law right now being discussed in the Colorado legislature to change that, basically putting in any willing provider provision. Got it, guys. So uh, do you know when would the, do, when do you expect the Colorado like ruling or the law would come? Well, set up. Well, uh, yeah, I, I think it might have passed the House and it's, still, it's in the Senate. After that, it would be go to the government signature. So. If it if it passes and is enacted, I would imagine we would hear about it by this. Uh, it would be in play by this summer. Okay, that would be really exciting because we hear this from uh, quite a bit of physicians. You know, it's almost like you know, you're either a physician guru or so on. You made some purchase on your favorite telemedicine system in there. All of a sudden, now this thing, well, you gotta pay for their system in there. Then I feel like they had to do the retraining. They do all these different things. It's feel like it's a little bit like. Uh, it is almost like the providers, of the insurer, pay forcing the, the to a little pay. Bit here on the, the the plus side, I am aware of at least a couple plans that um, would have contracted with telehealth software companies, mm -hmm. where the plan says we'll pay your the software fee and we'll just make it available to our providers who want to use it. That way, the providers have an easier path. Yes, it's maybe only one or two or three. Fine. But at least then they're giving their in-network providers a pathway to say, just try telemedicine, and you don't have to like it's zero uh, investment for the provider. It's a good way to get your head. Nice, nice. There. Um, I know we're uh, really a little bit we went over a little bit. We got still a bunch of questions. You know, I apologize to the audience. We did we're not able to get to everyone's questions, but what we're gonna do is we'll pass it to Nathaniel. Then he was able to come and we're gonna post their other recordings and then answer your questions on the the page after the session. Again, I just want to apologize 
So then it just like that's just <laughs> the question was a poor hand there for unfortunately I just couldn't get to all of them. Um, then the final question maybe I, I'll ask you as we wrap up is like uh, if you can uh, you know whisper in uh, President Trump's ear like you know three things you want him to do regarding specifically the telehealth or just the things like putting politics aside just like what are some policy what are things that would really help our industry like what are those things you will whispering his ears. Sure. I mean, I know there's a lot of transition and change with the new administration, but I, I remain bullish on health uh, technology, um, and I see some really interesting opportunities with some of the new appointees and some of these new laws that are going to go into effect. Three things. I would definitely say let's eliminate these artificial barriers to Medicare uh, coverage of telehealth services. Yeah. If you do so and it turns into some huge budget buster, which I think is incredibly unlikely, then they could always address it and change the change them back, put them back into play. That would that would be one because then I think a lot of payers will just sort of follow the role of uh, Medicare. I don't think we can. I'd love to see if there's a way to address licensure. I just don't see it happening under the Tenth Amendment and states' rights. Okay. Third one, it's not really telehealth per se, but it's uh, interoperability. And I think that's almost uh, like a concept, like perfection. <laughs> you know, it's there, people can see it, but no one, you can, can't really reach it. That would be, I think, a game changer on connectivity and intersection and, and, and tie with other concepts of blockchain and IoT that healthcare can. God, awesome. Thank you so much. This is an amazing session. Really appreciate it. And for the audience, uh, next week, uh, we'll be back again on Thursday. We have a really exciting speaker. So uh, you guys, our uh, audience know, we, probably, we do this for annual physical conference called Telehealth um, uh, Failures and Secrets to Success. So last year, our conference was one of the highest rated speaker and was been coming back to a webinar. Again, I think you can you really enjoy her insight in there. Again, Nathaniel, thank you so much for participating in our webinar. I really appreciate it.